I don't need someone who thinks like me and always agrees with me because if you always agree with me and we think the same, then there's no need for one of us. My wife really did because she opened up a whole world of knowledge and empathy uh, for me that just launched me into something I wanted to learn about. I want you to take away that you never know the person you meet, what's going on in their life. Mm -hmm. And you need to recognize that they could be fighting a battle you know you know no nothing about. So welcome to the Relevant Development Podcast. I'm your host, Juan Alvarado. Today's guest is Scott. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. How are you? Doing well. And is it Roop, Rup, how do you pronounce your last name? It's Roop. Everybody Roop. else in the world says Rup, except my family, but it is Roop. <laughs> Roop, got it. So tell us a little bit about you and your extensive background here. It's very impressive. Oh, well, hey, you're, you're very kind. Uh, yeah, hey, I, I've been blessed. I, uh, I've had a pretty, pretty awesome life. Uh, founded a couple of small businesses, built them up, sold them off. Got to follow my passion in life, which was politics at a very young age. Did two terms in the Missouri uh, uh, House of Representatives. Was elected the youngest state senator in Missouri's history uh, in the Missouri Senate. Served eight years there. And uh, at the age of 41, I was the most senior member of the Missouri State Senate, which uh, was wow. kind of bizarre, especially when you had a lot of older people there that, you know, <laughs> I was most senior. And then uh, we have term limits and the governor put me in charge of a, of a big state agency and I ended up regulating billion dollar utility companies uh, that are publicly traded because uh, they're monopolies and, you know, they, they don't have any competition. So right. I was the guy that would tell them when they could build a plant and what they could do and how could they could charge people. And, you know, just interacted with lots of different CEOs all over the, 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 the map and, uh, you know, had some interesting experiences in my life, ran statewide for a different political office. And that's when my brain just kind of said, hey, can't do this anymore. You need to simplify your life. And so then I redirected everything to uh, kind of using the principles of sustainability and applying them to people. I applied them to my own life and uh, really was starting to tell people about, hey, you can't continue at this pace. You got to listen to your, your body. And then the pandemic hit and everybody in the country went through this massive, significant emotional event. And mm -hmm. What happened to me earlier, I saw happening to everybody around me. And that was just a fascinating psychological of what's going on. And that led me to write my book, which is called I Quit Winning the War for Top Talent. And it's a deep dive into the psychology of what's going on in the modern workforce and what do employees want and how should leaders lead them to make sure they're you know meeting the needs of the current workforce moving forward uh a little bit of a a, a side question just because i'm so interested in in your background do you think that the book would have come out if you didn't have that route of politics and the stuff that you went through no yeah i was on a completely different path i mean burning the candle at both ends politics is a toxic culture and it seeps into your life uh, as much as you don't even want it to and you don't realize it's happening i lost my statewide election by uh, seven tenths of one percent oh. and oh, oh but i thank those voters every time for not electing me because it was <laughs> the best thing ever because it got me out of that toxic culture mm. and it showed me just how these cultures can seep into every area of your life, your marriage, your kids, how you view the world. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. What was your what was your expectation going in? And then what was the toxicity that that you finally saw, like you were unaware of that came that came in? What was your expectation? And then what was it actually? I mean, the expectation is, you know, you're there to do good and it's and, and there's this valiant purpose and you'll be surrounded by all these great leaders and people with all this integrity. You know, the people always ask me the one question after your 20 some years in politics, what's the thing that surprised you the most? And I always answer the number of people that I know that have been or are currently in federal prison. Mm. It was amazing just watching what you think all these people are elevated to this position and you think they're these wonderful, awesome people, but they're just regular people that get corrupted by power and influence and all the stuff that is thrown into politics. It's saddening of how toxic it is uh, and stuff. And so, yeah, so it was what you thought it was going to be and what it was was a huge, huge dichotomy. What do you and I didn't, I didn't even think we we're going to go. We were going to go here. But I, <laughs> what where do you think or what has to happen? Because I I've coached teams before and I'm talking sports teams mm -hmm. and, you know, teams in in 
uh, nonprofit and pro- for-profit uh, organizations. And the hope is, is that the team, when one person comes in, a, new, you know, a newbie, if you will, comes in, that the culture and the environment changes that one or those two or those three. But a lot of times it's those one or two or three that starts to change the, the culture of everybody else. You would True. think a lot True. of people like you who go in wanting to make change and do good, how, how come that doesn't happen? Like what is needed to have that culture, that political culture or for whatever, any culture for that matter, what has to happen to, to do what you went in to do, to do good? I mean, it, what has to happen is, is you got to have good people to, to start. And a lot of people are attracted to the political world, not, you know, not out of an altruistic, you know, uh, type of a, a viewpoint. It's like, Hey, it's, there's, it's, it was instant credibility and you got uh, admired and all this stuff. And so it's like, who are you putting in there in the first place? And then the second thing is, you know, the system is designed and it's so crap. You get good people in and I've watched such great people, which I consider myself a pretty, you know, upstanding young guy. I was very young. But just watched how just all the different influences and just it creeps. It creeps over time into your mindset and just it just it slowly happens. And then you wake up and you're like, well, how did I get here? I would have never have thought this or done this. And so it's sometimes it's the institution that just wears you down. Um, Mm -hmm. But, hey, I know some great people that went in there and they never changed because they had a strong vision about who they were, what their Mm -hmm. purpose was. I was 27 years old. I didn't know what my purpose was. I didn't understand what my mission in my own life was. Um, and so I was very easily uh, swayed because I didn't have that solid core foundation of who am I, what is my mission, and what is my purpose. Right. And which is huge for any individual in any organization, right? What is your True. what is your core? What is your foundation? What do you I heard this the other day. What is uh, what are you committed to? And I was like, I once I heard that that totally changed my thought process. It's like, yeah, we have goals and things like that, but what is it that you're committed to? And so if you're committed to your core, if you're committed to your foundation, you know, that's, that is, is pivotal as opposed to just going throughout your day. Um, True. Is this, is so what led to the book? I know you started talking about seeing the, the world kind of through COVID Mm -hmm. and them experiencing what you were going through. What, what, what do you think was like the straw that broke the camel's back in that sense that led you to your book and then what, and, and why the book? So it was when I was running statewide and I'd be 5 AM and I would be in the shower and you know, it was the only time life was quiet. I, you know, we have, my wife and I have five kids. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, this is your only time where it's quiet, you know, five kids getting them to school, trying, we're both working, running around, you'd run a statewide. I was up, you know, calling, dialing for dollars. And at 5am it was quiet. Mm -hmm. And my brain kept telling me it would would enter from this side of my brain and it would travel across and it would exit almost like a little bit of a, a ticker across. And it would just say, simplify your life, Scott simplify your life. And so this was happening for like two weeks straight. And so I did what I always do. I ignored it and I pushed on through my day because, oh, I don't, I mean, that, how do you simplify your life? I can't do that. I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. And it wasn't, wasn't until just, you know, I lost my election and then kind of got out of politics that I was just like, what do I need? And my wife became a mental health counselor and she is the most amazing person in the world. And she started to teach me about the brain and how the brain processes and trauma and what trauma does to how you view things. And then we started to see the pandemic come out and how much people were hurting and going through trauma and how that alters their brain patterns and how they will continually make choices and what PTSD does to the human brain. I mean, obviously with the military background, I mean, you understand how many people are impacted that. And and, and she started talking about the, the healing that could come from it through through you know, EMDR therapy and how yes. you can rewire the brain. And I got fascinated. And she would tell me these stories about, you know, that there's a story I talk about in my book. There's a, a, a guy, uh, all I know about is he was, he was served because of client confidentiality. But, uh, you know, he was having, you know, his marriage was falling apart. He was getting in arguments with his boss. He was irritable. He, was, he, he couldn't sleep. And he was a shell of himself. And his life was falling apart. And he came to see my wife. And, you know, he had been in the service. And they figured out he had some PTSD. 
And what they found out is going through this EMDR therapy was that every time he saw a backpack, he was going into the fight or flight mode and he was mm. his body without him even knowing it, he was getting irritable and his heart rate was going up and he just didn't feel good. And they were able to trace it back to, there was an IED that went off that killed a couple of his buddies mm -hmm. and he didn't realize it at the time, but later on his brain shut it. It was hidden in a backpack. So every time he was at the grocery store or when he took his kids to school, he would see a backpack and his brain would go into the fight or flight mode and he was in trauma and it, it, he was he was safe but his brain was telling him you're unsafe you're unsafe and it started this massive just change of his personality because his brain's telling him to flee and get help and he's just you know in the grocery store and somebody has a backpack he doesn't know so he was able to reprocess that and change the pathways in his brain to realize he was safe and his entire life changed his marriage improved his relationship with his kids improved and he got back to being his self you know so that was like fascinating about how our brains you know get us in this rut and then we looked around and we saw the entire country came out of this traumatic experiences some people had trauma within trauma if you lost a loved one or had a business that failed and then how is that impacting your view on work well, then right after the, 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 the pandemic, what did we have? We had the great resignation. We had people that were just like, yeah, I'm changing my entire view on work. I'm, you know, why am I driving 45 minutes to work one way to, to sit in an office where I can do the same work sitting at home? Right, right. You know, why do I have to take time off? Because my kid has, I have to take my kid to the doctor. He has back spasms, you know, or something in that right. nature. You right. know, it's like, why do I have to do that? And they started to reevaluate you know, their view of work, their life, what was important. And that is what happens after a significant emotional event, which was basically the trauma that caused the, you know, that came about in the, pun the pandemic yeah. and significant emotional event. I mean, your doctor tells you, hey, quit, quit smoking, lose weight. You ignore it. He tells you the next year, quit smoking, lose weight. You ignore <laughs> it. But what happens? You have a heart attack. And then you're like, yeah. oh, I should, pr you know, so it takes these events in our lives to push us out of our rut and then we start to reevaluate what's important. And the book goes into, this is what's happened in the workplace. In all these, especially the younger workers that, uh, you know, millennials and younger, their view on the American dream is different. What they are wanting out of their mm -hmm. life is different. It's not as driven by consumerism and things of uh, that we have seen, you know, in, in older generations. And it's just thrown the whole workplace into, into out of balance. And it's kind of fascinating because the data is still coming in and leaders are kind of like, well, what's going on here? Right. Because it's, it's so it's so different. There's a, a podcast that I did where I saw a TED talk by a seven year old girl. I think a seven or nine year old girl. Her name is Molly. I think it was Molly Wright. Mm -hmm. And she talks about the engagement with an adult and a child during their upbringing. And when the engagement's gone and the parent goes on a, you know, their uh, tablet or phone. Right then the the child starts to get changes emotionally starts to cry and complain because like hey the connection that i've made with True. my father or mother is gone and so now i'm going to whine or complain to try to get your attention the kids crawling on the dad and the dad's kind of being is being disengaged and she goes over five things that we could do and it's like create a, a supportive environment and engagement and create experiences and as i'm listening to this little girl talk about these five things that every child needs growing up i'm like these are the same five things that employees need from their bosses <laughs> like recognition and engagement totally. and totally and and so i it started to, she started to say like when this stuff happens like if it doesn't happen within the first five or six years then there's some issues that the child is going to grow up with and stuff and so i'm starting to think if we as an adult are now or those kids that because we're finding the the data of that the data that came from that and the findings those people are now in the workplace and so if they had a connection issue growing oh, wow. up they're probably having a connection issue at home or excuse me at, at work right and so i'm and then we you started talking about the mm -hmm. uh, emdr therapy right. which my counselor has told me like do it it's going to take your re, you know your recovery and stuff like that mm -hmm. to the next level like we've right. we've had huge leaps and bounds of you know correcting just some behaviors and thought processes and right, stuff right. and so but the thing is is there's a connection that i don't understand that now i'm starting to understand mm -hmm. and then there's an engagement piece of this 
is the why I see when I see this, I act this way, this happens. And so there's there's engagement, there's disengagement, there's a connection, there's a there's a misconnection. And when we can make those and realign those and rewire right. those things, then it becomes better. So what are you seeing in your book? Or do you agree with that? It's saying like if our kids are having these issues from adult to children right. when they grow up in the workplace, there's a disengagement because now I don't want to talk to totally. my boss. Right. Right. I grew up. Shut your mouth, sit down, be quiet, right. do as you're told. <laughs> and so now that we have kids going to school and it's like, well, did you talk to your teacher? No. Well, why not? Well, because I told to sit down and shut up. Exactly. Right. And so now I don't have that communication. Then we get into the workplace and now I don't want to talk to my boss or right. I'm a boss and I don't want to talk to my employees because I'm afraid of that engagement. Is that sure. something that you're founding or that you're oh, founding your, your book? Totally. I mean, I, I, I think you hit the, the, you know, the nail on the head of the, the disengagement of when we're younger and what, what is happening. And, and I just wrote a blog post. Uh, it's on my website because there was a new study that came out that basically said that uh, there's, a, there, there's a link between if you were able to play outside un, unsupervised and you will have a little bit you know, less anxiety than you would if you were had you know, constant hmm. supervision and a lot of structure and, and stuff. And they're, they're drawing that, that ability to like, I'm solving problems. Someone's not always there to kind of come in and, and you're, you're given that freedom to kind of like make mistakes and, and, and right. things. And I think that leads to, you know, you know, the, when you get into the workplace and the massive amount of anxiety that we are seeing in the workplace, FOMO, fear, you know, fear of missing out, imposter syndrome. I think there was a big study in the UK in 2019 with like 2000 millennials that one third of them, I mean, 33% of them said that they suffer from imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And when you dive down in which, so if your listeners don't know what imposter syndrome, it's like, you know, that, that fear that I'm going to be found out that I'm a fraud, that I should shouldn't be here because I'm not qualified that, you know, I'm an imposter. I'm really not, you know, supposed to be here in this position. It's that, and it's rooted really you know, like in perfectionism and then in kind of in, in fear. And it's that, that inability to, you know, to then ask for help if you need something, because all the data is coming out saying that, that I'm not going to go talk to my boss or my teacher or my professor, because I'm afraid they're going to think I'm lazy and they don't want to do the work, or they're going to think I'm weak. Uh, I think like 34% of the respondents in one huge survey said they're going to be viewed as weak in the workplace if they if they say they're struggling with workplace anxiety. Mm. You know, so so that's that fear is keeping them from, you know, and the boss might be, hey, I'll help you. We have employee assistance program. What do you need? We can restructure. But they're even afraid to ask because of how it's going to be viewed. And a lot of it is, you know, is that disengagement that, that we've, we, we've seen and, and everything else is, is growing up in today's culture. If I fear to make a mistake, I'm going to either cover it up or lie about it. Um, if I uh, if I have that if I didn't have that engagement at home, right? I'm not going to have it at at work. And we need to have a uh, you know, and if we don't have a leader that allows us to make a mistake, we're going to be scared. You know, I mean, we're going to be scared shitless to 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 screw yeah. up, and yeah. we don't um, have that ability to to mess to mess up. And I think that's a lot of you know agree or disagree that when you allow your staff to fail, like that's where the learning process processes start. But if we're always micromanaging and wanting to know everything in our hands, are you know we only have two hands, but we're in ten different cookie jars. You know our staff isn't going to to lead. So what do you what do you say to those leaders who feel like they have to? maybe micromanager or not micromanage, but I want to know every detail that is afraid to let their staff fail. Oh man, that's, that's, that's a big one because a lot of times it's, well, first of all, you have to have the, 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 the communication because what the employee is thinking might be completely different than what the leader thinks that employee is different. Um, you know, so it's like, like Facebook, they had a big sign on their wall when they were first starting that said, you know, done is better than perfect because they had a lot of certain types of personalities working in a high tech and, and to make it perfect. But in the tech world, it has to be you know done. And that fear of getting it wrong or that fear of it not being exactly right was delaying projects and things. And so they kind of had to impress upon people that it's okay if something isn't perfect. It's okay if you mess up and you fail or this isn't exactly you know per the perfect thing. We got to get it done and we'll work together to, to, to get that. But it was re you know, like just reinforcing that, reinforcing that. But what I find is, you know, leaders will say that, 
but will your HR division, will yeah. your legal division, <laughs> will they be, I mean, we can have the best, you know, culture sayings of what we want, but are those divisions being like, no, that you can't, and it has to be this way. And and so are we sending the same message um, of, hey, this is what we want you to do is be able to, to make a mistake. But if you do, how is the rest of the organization you know, right. treating that? Right. And nobody has it down packed. I mean, our phones seem like they get an update once a month. And if they were perfect, there wouldn't have been an up. There wouldn't be an update. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Everything. Everything is, you know, um, you know, we call it CQI, right? Continuous quality improvement. How do we how do we keep getting better at the stuff that we do? And you're not going to be perfect. There's nothing that is perfect, which is why, you know, iPhones come out with a new a new phone, a different generation every right. single year. One, because they want your money. But two, uh, they're trying to become, you know, they're trying to be become better going back to the book why the title i quit is because that's what people were basically they were quitting their old view of you know what their life or their career should be um and people were seeking out better you know better cultures where are they going to be rewarded um it was fascinating when you know when the great resignation was really going on you know you had two major studies done and they asked people, well, why are you leaving? You know, and why are you thinking of leaving? And what the responses were was, you know, I want to be somewhere unvalued or I want to have some work-life balance or I want to have the ability to have some remote work or something. But then they asked the employers of, of these companies that the people were leaving, they just interviewed, well, why is this person leaving Is Why is that? And what the employers were saying is like, well, they're just getting more money. And so it basically kind of came down to is the employers are like, oh, it's just more money they're leaving. And the employees are like, no, it's not about the money. It's about the culture it's about mm. the place am i being appreciated and they just said hey no my family's worth more my mental health right. is worth more right and so i am going to quit and i don't care i i'm gonna i'm just gonna go find something something else and collectively this happened and then you saw a big paradigm shift where you know now labor labor is kind of driving the market whereas beforehand it was always the employers and there was plenty of jobs if you don't like it go we'll fire you go somewhere else and now they're clamoring for workers and good workers are getting harder and harder to, uh, you know to find yeah what i read a, a report from gallup and i interpreted it this way they didn't say this but as i read it i tried to categorize or subcategorize the things that i read to see if i can make it simpler more more relatable to people that i train and and, and leadership and things like that and what i boiled it down to the great the in the great resignation why people are quitting was yes you're absolutely right it was employers thought that they're just leaving for more money mm -hmm. but the uh employees were were saying i'm leaving for a different value and what we found was or the gallup poll was like people found value in they were paying uh employees were paying for work uh excuse me for school mm -hmm. uh employees were paying for child care or they they built in a child care at their work like there's a daycare there right. in the building paying off uh student loans different benefits right. being able to work from home three days out of the five days or two out of the five days and so they found value and value is not necessarily money value is where that person found value you value me you value my family, you value my right. mental health, my physical health. I mean, some places were giving incentives for working out. If you can go and get your blood mm -hmm. tests and get all your panels done, right. we'll pay for it. And then if you we can see an uptick in your health, we'll give you a bonus. And so it's just like, what do you value? And I took it down even further. When you start to value the employee as a human being, right? that's huge. Is money part of it? Absolutely. I, oh, yeah. I'd leave my job in a second, you know, for $30,000 more. However, but when it comes with, oh, I don't have to work overtime or you're right. going to help pay for my kids to go to school, whatever it is, right? Uh, it's that value piece True. Uh, with that. I was just reading something the other day that if you have a, a, an employee who's engaged and, and they feel that they are value, it will take a minimum of 20 to 30% pay increase to entice them away. If you have an employee who is unengaged and doesn't feel value, it doesn't take one more dollar to get to entice them, them to leave and stuff. And so what, what companies can do is, number one, they got to get to know their employees, not just, oh, I, I, I know Bill, he lives over here, he has two kids. You got to get to know is, what do they value? What do they want out of their career? What do they need? You align all of, of their goals with their with the company goals. And then, you know, they, they're going to feel rewarded. They're going to feel engaged 
And then you don't, you're, they're not going to be looking for other opportunities if they truly feel that, hey, you know me and, and you're trying to help me be in my career. You're trying to help me with my life balance or whatever it is that I value. You know, because what I valued at 27 is a lot different than I valued when I was, you know, 47. Right, right, right. Um, and, and stuff. And so, but you have to understand who those, you know, what your employees are and, you know, what drives them. And then you have to, you know, actually listen and take action, not just be like, oh, okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the info. Right, right. Is that, is that just one key in how we keep uh, good employees? Because it seems like, it seems as if, good employees seem to leave like the bad ones when they leave it's like oh thank god they're gone right but for the most part it's like what you're leaving why and teams start to dismantle because the good employees aren't retained one why why aren't they being retained and then two how do we how do we retain those good staff yeah i, I got a chapter in my book and it, the title of it is why is the the dead sea dead and it's dead because, you know, the water flowing into it and it used to flow out into the Jordan River. But many, many years ago, it stopped flowing out. And so it just kept building up and building up the, and it would evaporate and it would left with all this salt. And the same thing is like, you know, it's dead because it's not pouring out into anything mm. and stuff. And so if we're continually just taking from our employees and we're just continuing to do it and we're not pouring back into them and stuff, then they're going to leave. They're going to up, they're going to evaporate, and then you're going to be left with all the employees that are just downright salty and there's not the ones you want. So. so good. <laughs> so good. Part of that, I I mean, there's different, I, I, I'm getting ready to do a, another podcast on like the seven deadly sins of an organization. What would you say are like, I don't know, maybe one or two deadly sins of leadership or management, what they do, like maybe regular practices that they do that kind of push employees away. And I would assume one of them, again, is not pouring into or pouring mm -hmm. out into the staff. What are some other things? I mean, because I'll mention some after if you maybe you don't mention them, but what are some reasons you see that staff are getting pushed out? I mean, I, from the 10,000 foot view is they don't, they don't know their employees. They, they know nothing about them. They don't, I mean, everybody has a different personality and, you know, using applied behavior analytics, you can learn so much more about, you know, who these people are and it helps you be a leader. It helps them, it helps you build better teams and it helps them interact with, you know, with each other. I'm in, in my organization. I know when I, when I get there and I walk down the hall that if I don't say hi to Sally and I just walk past her, she will internalize it the whole day. And she will think, oh my God, did I do something wrong? Why did he say hi? What did, what did I, and I, I know that about her. And so I just, I have to stop and I have to be like, hey, how was your weekend? Oh, how are the, how, how's your dog? Everything in just two minutes, because if I don't do that, it's just, that's her personality and she's going to internalize it and it's going to affect her workflow and stuff. But knowing that about her and about how she operates allows me to, you know, pour into her. And then that, that gives me so much more productivity and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I could have known that, oh, she had a dog and she had to do this, but I knew I had to stop and inquire. I mean, so it's those, it's those types of things is it's getting past the, okay, yeah, we hired you. Oh, you're great and stuff. Um, but then allowing your employees to learn about each other as well, mm -hmm. because, you know, how you and I communicate, how you and I view things, how you and I want to be in and, and, and how I want to not be disturbed in, in my area of focus and, and everything. And then it allows them to interact better. So really, you know, don't just get to know your employees, but but actually put things in place that help them to get to know each other. And then you know, that's that's like number one. I mean, that just that will open up so many more doors than any, anything else you can do. Yeah, for sure. I I do a thing with um, with teachers and for managers, too. We talk about the three different levels of relationships. And we I just say, like, we're not going to think about employee relationships and boss relationships. We're not talking about that. We're going to talk about when a boy meets a girl. We're going to talk about the phases of relationships. Right. Mm -hmm. So. They become acquaintances and then they become friends and then right. really good friends, maybe even best friends. But then they get in, let's say they get into a relationship, right? Boyfriend and girlfriend. So friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, engaged marriage. How do you get to each of those sectors? So just rifle off some of those ideas. And so then people are like, uh, spend time together, trust, uh, communication, spend time with each other. And it's like, okay, how do you get from boyfriend, girlfriend to engagement? It's like more uh, time with each, with each other and, you know, different levels mm -hmm. of trust, right. um, compassion, love. And we go through everything. And then I say, okay, let's erase boyfriend, girlfriend, 
engaged marriage. Take those things out. One of my caveats is I say, pretend grandma's in the room or there's kids in the room. Let's keep this G rated. Let's not get <laughs> go into anything because it's going to get weird later. I promise you. Um, right. So let's not talk about that. But it's just those simple things. Right. And then I say, this is what your employees need from you. Mm -hmm. engagement, communication. They want to know that you trust that you trust them and they trust you. So how do you give trust, right? You have to, in, in order to give, get trust, you got to give trust True. communication, right? Relationships are built on a monologue, not a dialogue, uh, right. on a dialogue, right. not a monologue. Uh, and so we start to see these different things. And so when you say get to know your staff, not just get to know them by name, but also get to know how do they want to get uh, recognized, right? I think recognition right. is pretty big. Do you have anything regarding recognition? Oh, I mean, if your audience has not read the five love languages book by uh, uh, Mr. Chapman, they need to, to go read that because it will help yeah. your relationship just you know, you go. And for those that haven't read it, you know, basically his theory is that there's your five love languages, but people want to love the way that they want to receive love. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so for, for my wife, she was, you know, she loved words of affirmation and I am like acts of service guy because I spent 20 years in politics and words mean crap to me because you're just, <laughs> I've been right. lied to and stabbed <laughs> and stuff. But she longed to hear these words of, of love. And, you know, so she was telling them to me and I'm like dismissing them going, whatever. But I'm going, look what I did for you. Look what I did. And, you know, reading that book was was, was amazing for our relationship. Yeah. You know, and then uh, Mr. Chapman and I think another name, uh, he worked with Paul White, I think. And they wrote the five languages of appreciation in the workplace. And it's very, very similar type of thing is you have to understand how each employee wants to be appreciated. I mean, mm -hmm. we're always like, oh, hey. Good job. Let's let's have a pizza party for Bill because he hit his you know sales yeah. quota. And Bill is an introverted guy. He comes home and he tells his wife, he's like, you won't believe what they did to me. They gathered everybody in a room and they all were focused on me. I mean, it was a punishment to Bill and instead of yeah. not a reward. So how do you want to be appreciated? And right. there are different ways. And, and, and do you want it done? privately or publicly right because right. that gets weird i i always yeah. revert back to like singing happy birthday it's just so weird just to sit there and have all these people sing to you and all eyes are on you You're like what do you what do you do like i don't know what to do with my hands i don't know do i do i smile like what do i do and so it's yeah it's different for it for people what would be your your two one or two maybe even three keys for just phenomenal leadership for somebody who's looking to either level up their leadership or go into leadership? Well, the, the first thing I tell people that moved my leadership game to the complete next level is I quit trying to be the most interesting person in the room. And I started to become the most interested person in the room. Mm -hmm. And really a lot of us, we spend all this time, well, look at my resume, look what I did. And I did this and I did that. And I'm great. And oh, running around. And it really is the people that take the time to stop and learn about their coworker, learn about, you know, what they are, what is important to them. And if you're a leader and you learn about, you know, you know, how does this person want to be appreciated? You know, what's going on in their life? And you, you find out so many more things that goes into that, you know, that, that communication level, it gets into the, you know, the, the healthy level of, uh, you know, of attachment, you know, that, you know, you need to have a healthy level of attachment of the workplace, which goes back to what we were talking to, to bring it full circle about with, with, the, with the kids and the level of attachment they had, you know, at home and stuff. But really, it's just being interested is so much more powerful than being, oh, hey, look at me. Uh, I was on Dr. Phil or, hey, look at me. I was right. on Lou Dobbs and which I used to, I used to like try to wow people with, hey, I've got, I've eaten dinner in the White House three times before I graduated high school. And people are like, what? Oh, that's cool. You know, I don't do that anymore. It's more like right. find out, you know, because you leave, talk to somebody long enough, you're going to find out some pretty interesting stuff. And then right. it becomes about them. And that's the number one thing that just really game for me. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I like that. Be, stop being the most interesting person in the world, but start to be the most interested person. Right. I like that. Right. Yeah. I like that. What are some, the organization and the company that I run is Raise the Bar. Mm -hmm. So how, I mean, you kind of alluded to some of that already, but what has helped you raise the bar, whether it's a book or a song or a person or a training, maybe a website, what has helped you raise the bar? My wife really did because she opened up a whole world of knowledge and empathy uh, for me that just launched me into something I wanted to learn about. And also, uh, you know, a little bit more of a compassion of getting you get jaded after a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so 
surrounding yourself with people that have different viewpoints than you do, different personalities, different thought processes. And that's why diversity in the workforce is so important because people bring in different ways to attach the problem. But just opening myself up to, hey, I'm not the smartest guy, or I don't have to immediately have the right question. Again, being more interested, listening a little bit, what are your, how would you solve this problem? You know, you know politics taught me that there's seven to 10 solutions for every problem. They're all just dependent on what your political ideology was and how you approach it with your preconceived, mm-hmm. you know, what am I putting around this problem? Uh, but when you bring somebody in that has a different viewpoint, they don't have those barriers they've already put around the problem. They're looking at it with a completely uh, a different, different viewpoint. You know, so she taught me that. And it's really just opening yourself up beyond a superficial Oh, a conversation here. I mean, my wife and I talk, we go on walks all the time and I spend time. I mean, she's really mentored me on Mm. so many areas of my life uh, um, that I haven't, uh, that I needed work on and stuff. So mentorship is huge. Find a mentor, especially somebody that's not like you, that is different, that brings a completely different uh, aspect. Uh, You know, that's, that is, that is huge. Yeah, I heard it this way. And this is where my mind went when you said that my old CEO had said, I don't need someone who thinks like me and always agrees with me. Because if you always agree with me, and we think the same, then there's no need for one of us. That's right. Right. If we're exactly the same, there's no need for one of us. And I'm the senior. So you're going and not yeah. me. Yeah. Right? And, um, just, and be sur- and, and I, I talk about it in the book too, is, is being surrounded by yes people. I mean, yeah. is, 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 are people afraid to talk to you because you don't have that relationship you've built of open communication? Or are they just wanting you to be happy? Um, right. You know, I, I use a story in, uh, that I sat in on a, a, a boot camp for a, a, a company that was doing some leadership development. And they had uh, given a list of questions to the, these senior executives to go interview somebody in their, their their company. And so this lady went and interviewed this person and asked all the questions. She came back. She's like, oh, our culture is great. This person is really happy. And I, I lead them well. And they're very, really engaged. And they you know, gave me high praises on how I'm doing everything. And the company culture is great. This is kind of what she thought. Until the week later, he put in his two weeks. And it was like, whoa. And then they started to go back and realized that, no, everyone found it so much easier to let the senior executives think everything was great. So they didn't have to Mm -hmm. deal with it and and stuff. And so it's like, wow, what are am I surrounded by a bunch of yes people or am I surrounded by people that are afraid to to tell me what they what they think? Um, You know, so again, yeah, I don't want someone else that thinks like me. My my legal advisor, um, you know, my, my last position, completely political opposite of me. I mean, we're talking, you couldn't get two ends of the, of the spectrum. That's one of the reasons I hired him is because to challenge me, make me think in different ways. And we would go back and forth on things and stuff, but it just got me out of that group think or, oh, I'm surrounded by yes people. Yeah. I, is it is it Stephen Covey that says that gives the whole get the right people on the bus? Is that him that says that? Yeah. Says that? And that challenged me. I agreed and disagreed with that because it depends on what kind of leader you are, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody might think, Oh, I need to get the right people on the bus. So I need to get the right people that think like me. And that's not the case. Like you have to challenge yourself as a leader. No, I want the people who are going to push the envelope. I want somebody who's going to give me something from left field and be like, oh crap, I didn't even think about that. So uh, I remember when we were going over the book in our leadership class, I was like, ah, I kind of disagree with the right people on the bus because mm-hmm. if you're the wrong yeah. type of leader, you're going to get yes people because to you, those are the right people to get on the bus. Right. And I would right. say, no, it's not. You need to get the wrong people on the bus. Right. And then because most people tend to lead the way they were led mm. and they think that's great leadership. But, you know, when you have different people on the bus, they each need to be led in the way they need to be led. And so right. you as a leader have to recognize that. And be like, hey, the way I am going to lead Juan is going to be completely different the way that I'm going to lead Scott. And, right. and and that is what a good leader, you know, really recognizes is the individuality of each member on their team and what they need rather than, hey, it's a one size all. I'm a great leader. Look at me. And, right. uh, you know, only getting people on my my bus that agree with me. Right. I think I even see it as coaching, right? You have all these online coaches and leadership mm-hmm. and executive coaches. And it's like when they say it's a flat fee of whatever it is. Like if you look at just that principle of I'm going to coach everybody the same is like, well, I'm not going to need the same right. coaching as the next person. Right. And so right. when you when things are tailored to you like a suit, right, mm-hmm. you can get a suit that's 
40 like 44 long or 44 right. regular and that's and this is the cost it's 399 but for somebody to say no we're going to custom fit it to you mm -hmm. it's it's more expensive right it's it's at a completely different level yeah i love that uh last question what can our listeners do to help them raise the bar what advice do you have for our listeners to help them raise the bar i mean number one love love for people to read the book uh go to, to scottroop.com uh it's a pre-sales going on uh, and then an audio book and ebook and everything will be on Amazon the the, the middle of, of, of November. Uh, so that would be great. But that's just kind of self-serving. What what people need to to do and what I would recommend that that they all do is expose themselves to different viewpoints, expose mm -hmm. themselves to different ways of of thinking because we all tend to get in a rut of how we think and how we approach problems. And it isn't until we have something significant in our lives that jolts us out of that. And typically it's a negative thing. And don't wait for those bad things to happen to make you reevaluate. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I leading this way? Why am I thinking this way? Continually challenge yourself with different viewpoints, different, different movies, different books, different podcasts, different music. Um, now you're not going to like it all, but what you'll find is you're going to meet people that do like stuff. And then you have a commonality of right, right there because you got out of your own rut and then your ability to lead different types of people just goes through the roof. There's a lot of lessons in that. I, I the thing that I take away is, and I want people to, to hear this is like, how awesome is it to hear somebody that's been in politics for so long to say their number one advice for you is to get the different thought processes from everybody as yeah. opposed to anyone, everyone, like I'm only going to listen. I'm a Democrat. The only thing I'm going to listen right. to is a democratic view or a Republican view or whatever it is, but to get differences and different people around you to help lead you or uh, sure. help you grow in that sense. I love, I love it's that. So needed right now. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. I know I said that that was the last question, but I couldn't help, but ask, want to ask, I get your book. What is like one or two main takeaways that you're like, man, if you read the book, this is either what you'll take away or what I would want you to take away from reading this book. I want you to take away that you never know the person you meet, what's going on in their life. Mm -hmm. And you need to recognize that they could be fighting a battle you know you, you know no, nothing about. Then once you get to know that person, you can minister to them, whether it is through you know leadership, friendship, whatever it is that, that they need. And if you're in a work setting, you can apply that to, to, so, to so many things. But really, it's getting to know the people around you beyond the superficial level and really connecting with them. That is when you build bonds. That is when you grow as a person. That's when you can pour into other people. Um, and that will help your family life. It'll help your personal life. And it'll help you help help your work life. Amen. I couldn't agree more with that. Hey, Scott, thank you so much for being here today. I, I think if you're up for it, I would love to do another another um, podcast uh, episode and get in the weeds of some of the like that psychological, you know, connection piece, maybe talk, you know, some numbers and, and stuff that will help us um, understand that a little bit more. But great talking to you. Uh, I, I, again, 100 questions going through my head every single uh, every time you, you spoke. And, I, you know, we were kind of pressed for time in each episode. So, but I'd love to do this again if you're up for that. I'd love, I'd love uh, that. The, the human brain is so fascinating, man. Once you dive into it and you start learning stuff, you're like, whoa, this is amazing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that'd, sure. that'd, be a, that'd be a great, that'd be a great deep dive. How can we uh, keep up with you? How can we connect with you if we want to uh, sure. know more about you? Yeah, just go to, to www.scottroop.com. Uh, got a newsletter you, know, you can sign up for, a weekly blog, and just or you can communicate with me. Me, me that way. And, uh, you know, that would be great. And just love to, to try to just provide great content for people to raise, raise the bar. Yeah. Awesome. All those things, uh, will be in the show notes and in the, in the description. Scott, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, remember that you, if you want to make your development relevant, this is the place to do that. And always remember to, in order to get to that next level, you need to raise the bar and pull yourself up so you can get to the next level, but you can't do that unless you raise that bar. Thank you so much. And we'll see you on the next episode.